Thanks, everyone. Well, a, it, it really is a pleasure for me as well. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'm delighted to be able to tell you about some of the, the stuff that I've been working on and that I'm really passionate about. Uh, and uh, as you um, have seen in the email, uh, I've kind of framed it in terms of the categorization heresies. So as we go through the talk, I'm, I'm hoping it will become clear uh, how some of the things that we're doing have kind of created a bit of passion in response to our work. Um, so we're going to start at the very beginning and talk a little bit about what is categorization. And so I'm going back to good old Medin for some nice uh, definitions. What good are categories? Categorization involves treating two more distinct entities as in some way equivalent in the service of accessing knowledge and making predictions. Categories are partitioning or class. Um, classification is not simply based on direct matching, um, but rather requires example have the right explanatory relationship to the theory organising the concept. So these are um, important concepts which we're going to be sort of talking about through the talk today. Uh, and as you can see, sometimes it's not entirely clear what the nature of a category is, right, uh, until you get to the end. So <clears throat> we can think of categories as quite uh, abstract things, and a lot of research in categorization, of course, is done around quite uh, abstract notions. Um, and what's important here is that <clears throat> um, the theory or the context can determine the most meaningful theory that we would apply. And so work, even in this kind of very basic object category level, uh, would demonstrate the importance of knowing whether you've got one kind of dimension of relevance here or another. Okay. So when we talk about social categories, uh, this same kind of general concepts apply, but of course we're dealing with much more complex social dimensions of similarity and difference. Right? But my argument really is that <clears throat> these very basic categorization principles can be applied and understood uh, in a sort of social context. So the main kind of assertion and the heretical assertion that I'm kind of making is this notion that a person is a social category. Um, and therefore that an individual person is the social theory that organises, in a sense, our experience of that person. Right? So we often act as if a person is a, a social fact, a social atom, right? and everything else is built up from that. But I, I argue that, of course, that's not the case that we often just presume that to be the case because our perception of persons most of the time is unproblematic. Uh, but I argue that fundamentally we make the same kinds of perceptual processes in determining what constitutes a person and how that person can be described as we would for other social things like groups and so forth. So we can see some of the kind of uh, comparisons that we can draw when we start to think about what might we, how might we understand a person understood as a category? Well, um, the easy reference is, is the persons in categories, because in social psychology at least, this is the major way in which the word categorization is used. Um, and so <clears throat> we can treat a category label as describing a collection of people, males, females, etc. Whereas when the person is as a category, the category label describes the person. So most often a name, uh, but it could also be that guy or the person in the blue shirt. Right? But uh, if there's a category label that for any particular purpose represents the person. In group categories, instances are the individuals that make up the collective. So uh, they're representations of individual people in the group. For persons, the instances are representations of our specific experiences and interactions with that person, whether they're our own or whether they're um, projected by others, but the instances are uh, individual representations. Summaries of a group category are stereotypes. Right? So we have a lot of theoretical work that uh, knows about stereotypes. Um, at the person side, we could say that really the summary of the person category is just personality. So we also have a lot of research around personality and we have some of the same issues about the appropriateness of personality judgments as we do about stereotype judgments. But again, most personality theorists don't think that what they're doing is talking about categories. Um, our representations of group-based categories uh, may be either based on individual specific instances, exemplar uh, kind of things, or summary descriptions, prototypes. 
Similarly, for persons, we may have uh, specific instances of interaction with a person, exemplars, right? or we might have a sort of summary description of a person, right? a prototype. Context is quite important, as I mentioned before, and so in the context of uh, when we think about groups, an important distinction that's made in the literature is between an intergroup context and an intra-group context. So if it's an intergroup context, then what tends to happen is our perceptions uh, solidify around the differences between groups, and we tend to see those groups as more homogenous. If we compare um, Scots with um, the English, we're more likely to see each of those two groups as more homogenous than if we just think about Scots as an individual category. All right, uh, we sort of te them tend to focus on the differences uh, amongst Scots. Similarly, for persons, we can argue that the context could be intra or interpersonal. If I'm comparing myself with another person, I'm more likely to caric caricature to some degree myself in making that comparison. Whereas if I'm just thinking about myself in general, I'm more likely to see all the different diversity of uh, who I am in different cir circumstances. Um, so hopefully this seems plausible, right? But <coughs> um, this is not the way social psychology generally sees categories, and certainly not social cognition. So I've got here some examples of uh, the kinds of uh, some quotes that sort of deal with these uh, kinds of issues. So, for example, um, perceivers can satisfy the objective of simplifying demands of person perception is by responding on the basis of categories, categorical thinking. Category relevant responses are accessible immediately upon classifying an individual as a member of some social group. So that's the first thing that people do. Right? In some, the propensity for category based cognitive processing to prevail speaks to the powerful effects of categorization over individua individuation. So here we see they're setting up categorization and individuation as contrasting poles, right? And categorization wins, it's faster, it's more efficient. In person perception research, the term category is used to describe the totality of information that perceivers have in mind about various groups of individuals. So McRae makes it very explicit here that that's what categories are in social cognition. I think one of the major problems with this uh, is that this disconnect between the abstract possibilities of categorization as a process uh, and this very uh, orthodox use of categorization as a group only kind of phenomenon in social psychology and social cognition leads to a couple of unfortunate consequences. Um, one is that there's a number of confounded assumptions that uh, permeate across different areas of the field. And because of this underlying orthodoxy, these confounds tend to get just reiterated and repeated. Right? You can't cha challenge the confound, as we'll see, without broaching a kind of heretical uh, kind of response, right? or response to the heresy. Um, and the, so that's one side, is these confounds which, which persist. The other thing, which ultimately in some ways is more important, is that we're missing out on huge possibilities that come about when we can see social perception more broadly. So we're missing out on how what we learn about one domain can actually inform another domain when we treat those as being qualitatively different kind of processes. Um, so the research program I've been working with and, and quite passionate about has kind of tackled both of these kinds of problems in various ways. Um, and so I'm going to give a number of uh, examples, some quicker than others. Um, the one where we actually started this work was uh, in the area of homogeneity and attribution. So there's two um, effects which, um, although they're actually both challenged now, for, but for probably 30 years or so, they were considered the most robust effects in social psychology. Right, so the uh, outgroup homogeneity effect, the idea that we will always see our outgroup as more homogeneous than we see our in-group, and that that's the basis of stereotyping and prejudice, etc. And at the individual level, that the, the actor-observer effect, that we're more likely to see our own behaviour as situationally caused, whereas other people's behaviour is more dispositionally caused. All right. um, these, these were researched for quite some time and were considered very robust. And we argued that these are the same, these are the same effect. All right. They're both categorization effects, they're both, in a sense, saying the in-category right, is going to be seen as more variable, particularly because it's in a one-category context, it's in an intra-category context. Right? The out-category is going to be seen as homogenous, 
because you can never perceive the out category except in an inter-category uh, way. All right, and so we argued, so I'm going to, other than that, I'm going to skip over that first thing that we did. Um, so I'm just mentioning it to sort of provide some context, really. And I'm going to be dealing with these other, all of these other examples that we've got here in, in that order. So the first thing I'm going to leap into is some work on uh, entertivity that we did. Um, and my standard joke uh, about this, which uh, I'll repeat because it's a standard joke, uh, is that um, you can only do research in this area if you can actually say entertivity fast uh, several times. Well, that's a nice tongue twister. Um, <coughs> and uh, entertivity has been brought into play in social cognition in a way, I think, of avoiding the idea of categorization. So I think what happened was at some point they decided that categorization was a collection of individuals. So if you wanted to think about how other social objects might have some kind of uh, sort of unifying nature, you needed a different concept. And so they revisited um, the old kind of gestalt uh, idea that uh, uh, Campbell raised of entitativity. Um, so, um, Hamilton and Sherman in 96 um, argued, uh, we think correctly, for a common unifying process underpinning both person and group perception. But rather than being categorization, they argued that it was the perceptions of entitativity. But they couldn't escape the orthodoxy. So you, if you read that paper, you can feel their tension. On the one hand, they want to say entitativity is a common thread which links both person and group perception. But we know that persons are more entitative than groups. We know in some sense that persons have uh, a fundamental reality to them that groups don't have, right? uh, according to the orthodoxy. Right? And so somehow they had to find a way of balancing these two kind of contradictory kind of ideas. Uh, and in our view, in trying to do that, what they did was introduce an unfortunate confound in their studies, uh, which we'll, we'll look at now. So, to understand this, uh, this work, um, just need to understand a couple of terms that tend to get used in this kind of domain. Uh, there'll be, the concepts will be familiar, but sometimes terms get used in sort of strange ways. So just so that we're clear, they talk about holistic versus piecemeal processing. And the idea here is just that if, if something is being perceived as an entity, then more likely you will actually, um, when you receive uh, descriptions about those things, Right, or, you'd, or those things are described, they're more likely to be described in summary terms. Um, if it's not perceived as an entity, then descriptions are more likely to be processed as one by one, as in a piecemeal kind of a way. Right? Uh, and related to that is this idea of online versus memory-based judgments. And the idea here is that if, you, if at the moment of perception you think of something as an entity, then you're more likely to construct a mental representation which integrates all of the information that you're given. Right, whereas if you don't see what, what the experimenter knows to be the, the entity involved, but the, the participant doesn't, right, if they don't see the entitivity there, then they're more likely to treat the pieces of information they're given uh, uh, um, as piecemeal. Right? Um, but what that means is that later on, when they're asked about that entity, the ones who always saw it as an entity will have a preformed sort of structured judgment to be made. Right? Whereas those who didn't will have to actually go back and reconstruct it from the exemplars. Okay? And so that's what we mean here by memory-based or online judgments. It's made online, you prejudge. It's memory-based, you have to reconstruct it. Oh, sorry. So the, um, <coughs> the consequences of this uh, is that if, we're making, uh, if we made online judgments, we should have better recall because the connections will be stronger and we'll have a primacy effect because they'll all be, the, the first thing will be the centre of the, of the representation. If we're making memory-based judgments, we'll have poor recall overall and a recency effect because we'll be tapping into our exemplars back to front. So <coughs> McConnell et al. argued um, that um, two things, uh, these, these two contradictory things. They argued, first of all, that we should be able to manipulate this idea of entitativity. Right? And so at these two sides of the design, if they explicitly encouraged you to think of either a person or a group as entitative or not entitative, then you would respond to that explicit instruction. So if you're told that the person is, is uh, high in entitivity, you would take, uh, have an integrative 
sort of um, memory structure for both persons and groups. And if you're told that they're low in intuitivity, then you wouldn't bother to construct a representation and you would have uh, a non-intricative thing. The key for, for some of them was this no information condition in the middle. So what would happen if you didn't a priori dispose them to think of, uh, of these things as entative or not? And so their argument was that persons would be by default perceived as entative, groups would not, and so we would get integrative processing for persons but not for groups. And, and their data seems to support this contention. So uh, if we look at, and so what they did was use the, the anchor point of the high and low intuitivity uh, as their reference. So if you look at the person in the no information condition, we get high recall as we would expect for integrative processing. Um, however, for the group, we get lower recall as we would expect for non-integrative processing. Um, our argument is that there is actually something else going on here because if you look a bit closer at the method, uh, and as I've discovered over, over looking at these things over a period of time, often you can see how the influence of the orthodoxy if you look a bit closer at the method, right? because the kind of assumptions that people make, so subtle assumptions that people make, are often buried deep within the method section. Right? And we can see that here when we look at the way in which their items are constructed. So what they did was, uh, this, this whole paradigm is based on uh, earlier work on person memory. And so in that earlier work on person memory, you would just have uh, a statement like this, Jim saves cans and bottles for recycling. You get a bunch of statements like this and then you do a free recall task and so on. Right? So, um, and so what they wanted to do was then compare that to groups. And so what they did was just simply add to the front of it, right, um, Jim, a member of group A. Right? So they really just added the group membership to the statement. Right? The problem with that is that they didn't kind of think about the fact that that then creates two different levels of representation. Because now, Jim saves cans and bottles for recycling is a holistic description of, of Jim. Right? Like the, the wording here suggests that this is something that's a quality of Jim. Whereas in the, in the other case, a member of group A does it, doesn't tell us anything about the group as a whole. Just tells us about a single instance of the group. And so what we have right, is a uh, summary description versus an exemplar description, and we've used the apples and oranges idea to kind of represent that. So this, this captures the underlying orthodoxy that persons are apples. Right? They, have a kind of a, they have a core, and they have a kind of consistent quality to them, right? a consistent kind of fleshy quality to apples. Whereas oranges, made up of segments. Right? Um, so oranges are like groups, they're kind of the segments are the things that are real and they're just collected together loosely in an uh, easy to peel uh, case. Whereas apples, hard to peel, nice uh, fleshy consistency with a core. All right? So I just want you to remember that analogy. All right? um, um, so what we wanted to do was to kind of really unpick this and so we were focusing particularly on this uh, middle condition. The two grey cells here are the ones from our design, so this is the third study in a series, um, and two by three design here, and the ones in grey are the ones which are closest to the original conditions that we're trying to map out here. Right? So for the person, there's a general description. For the group, there's a, it's a member of the group. Right? And what we've done here is systematically turned uh, uh, both person and group descriptions in general terms, as well as person and groups in, um, in instance terms. And the difference between the last two um, columns is not that important, but whether we just name the instance or not. Uh, some have argued that that's important. Um, as it turns out, it's not. Um, and so here we can see, basically, there's a higher recall if either person or group is described in general terms. Right? Lower recall for persons and groups described in more instance terms, exemplar terms. Right? No effect for person versus group. So once we control for these wording differences in some, in, you know, make attempt to control for that, right, what we find is that a priori difference disappears, mostly. There is uh, something that's a little bit left over in that, so we, uh, I, I think of this as an implicit measure, right, because it's a, it's a free recall memory task. They don't really know that what they're doing is judging the entity of a thing, they're just recalling stuff, right? Um, but we did also have an, an explicit measure of perceived coherence. And on the explicit measure, you still get this difference for the instance 
uh, instances. Um, but what you get is only for people, so this idea here is only for people who a priori assume that all entities have coherence. Right? Whereas the incremental theorists assume that um, things have variability and so forth. Right? So for an explicit measure, we get these kind of prior expectation kind of effects. So <clears throat> what's the heresy here? Well, one critic has argued that, um, and, and I didn't literally put their words here just because they're a bit wordy, but this really is the implication. We already know that people are seen to be more coherent than groups. Right? Therefore, any attempt that we make to kind of make the wording seem more equivalent, we're distorting the situation. Right? We're distorting reality right, in trying to, in a sense, create a better experimental control. Seriously, that's the argument. Right? Um, they also argued that groups must vary more, more than individuals because the higher category must vary at least as much as the elements within it. So again, you see here something about this orthodox view that groups are made up of persons, right? The persons are the atoms and groups are the collection, right? And that that's the only way to see it, right? Because that's the only way to make sense of that criticism, right? That the higher thing must be at least as variable as the underlying one. If you see them as varying on different dimensions, as we do, right, then it doesn't make any sense. And so our response to this, um, because a, a, lot of, a lot of this, we think this orthodoxy comes from this fundamental assumption that persons are somehow more real than groups. And so our kind of rhetorical response to that is to say, we think persons are no more real than groups. All right? So I mean, we can argue about whether persons or groups are real, but we would argue that wherever you, wherever you fall on that continuum, persons and groups have the same level of realness to them. Um, <clears throat> so then we wanted to explore this in a quite different domain. Uh, and so we looked at some face processing stuff and this comes out of a, a domain of literature um, that really focuses on the very first moments of perception, of impression uh, that people make. Well, so the assumption here is that as soon as we meet somebody, one of the earliest things we do is perceive their category membership, right? um, largely, you know, or can be through facial representations, right? um, and that you'll be faster to detect group membership of faces than you will to individuate those faces. Okay. Um, so there's two assumptions that underpin this work. Um, so it's faster to categorize faces than to individuate them. Uh, that's their assumption and it's what their data tends to suggest. Um, but then they are also argue that this faster categorization arises because um, categories have featural cues that are easier to see. Right? So this is an explanation for why it might be that categories are in fact faster and easier to do. So we found two really confounds in this. One is that if you're making a male-female decision, right, you, it's, it's what we call a chunked uh, um, kind of task. So you're just really deciding A or B. That's all you've got to do, right? So you've only really got to test the stimulus against a prototypical representation of A or B. But if you're being asked, is this face familiar? then potentially you've got to do an unending memory search, right? Is it this person? Is it this person? Is it this person? Is it this person? Of course, it doesn't quite happen that way. But the point is that you, you, there, there is not a clear, you know, you can't stop after two, two kind of comparisons. You've got to go on a bit, right? And so, and there's no a single set of features that would define the people that you know from the people that you don't know, right? So you can't just match things. You actually have to check, right? And so to us, it's no surprise that it's faster to do the male-female pattern matching task right, than it is to do a memory search task. Right? This is not at all surprising to us. Um, <clears throat> and so we did a couple of very quick experiments to kind of demonstrate this idea. Uh, and then the other thing was the featural cues. So we felt that persons could also have featural cues, uh, and so that would also have an impact upon uh, categorization at the person level. So we uh, did some work to un unpick this. And so we, we did a, a sort of fun study where we actually replicated uh, the two main conditions from this work uh, and then added a new condition. So the, the familiarity condition, um, basically you've got some faces and you have to just decide whether they're familiar or not. And uh, that's just under 700 milliseconds reaction time to do that task on average. The gender condition is are those faces male or female? Um, uh, and interestingly, in the original work on this, the males all had short hair and the females all had long hair. So again, they're confounding featural cues with 
categories and all sorts of stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> so are these males or females? Well, you're a bit quicker to say whether they're male or female. So the key thing for us is we invented a Johnny Depp Brad Pitt condition, right? So you have to decide is a face Johnny Depp or is a face Brad Pitt. Now it turns out these are a good example because they've changed their, their look. I mean, they're both very fluid kind of actors, right? So them, they themselves and their personal lives have changed their look quite a bit over the years. I've picked two photos which they're most similar, but in fact, they're, they're at different points, they've all had long hair, short hair, beards, and various other kinds of things, right? Um, <clears throat> so the key question is, is this gonna look more like the fami familiarity one because this is individuation, these are people, right? So if it's about individuation, then this should be the same as the uh, familiarity condition. If this is a categorization task that has nothing to do with whether it's a person or group, then it should look more like the gender task, and of course it does. All right, <clears throat> so, uh, so that was one study we did, and then another study which I'll just talk about very quickly is we took the Brad Pitt Johnny Depp task, and then we wanted to also see, yeah, could you have a, a, a cue for the person as well, and so we picked George Clooney and Bruce Willis because they have a very obvious hair cue, or lack thereof, right, uh, and so, uh, we now see that for, and then we had males and females either with a mixture of long and short hair or all males short or females long, right? So <clears throat> with, the, um, with the group ones, if there's no cue, they're a bit slower than if there is a cue. And same with the person, okay? So no differences there in category uh, type, only in the nature of the task, okay? Uh, I've done some more studies in the line, but I'm just going to give you those two just to give you a flavour. Um, so, what's the heresy here? Well, first of all, we're accused of an obvious confound because in the group condition, there are 20, uh, in this case, identities that are unrepeated. So you're given 20 different males and females. Whereas in the person condition, there are only two persons, Brad Pitt and Johnny Depp, who are repeated. Right? And so the assumption of the criticism right, is that somehow we've confounded in terms of the number of repetitions of the person, right? There are 20 peoples in, people in one condition, only two people in another, right? Um, <clears throat> so the a priori assumption here is that a face of Johnny Depp is Johnny Depp, right? Um, whereas a, a female is not a female, they're a person who happens to be female, right? Uh, and so that somehow these are different to different processes and that therefore you wouldn't get priming of one female to another female, but you would get priming from one Johnny Depp to another Johnny Depp. Now, <clears throat> because this is done by social psychologists rather than face perception people, they're a little bit confused about what um, repetition priming is actually all about, and that generally tends to happen with literally exactly the same image, right? not just for another image of the same category. Right? So it doesn't apply logically to our design at all, but just to be sure, we tested it, right? uh, and it has no effect. Right? So we argue here a face is not a person. We have to make the same inference based on a picture of uh, any given picture. If we want to infer a person or if we want to infer a group, we still have to make an inference, right? Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a bad intuition for us to kind of say, oh, that's a photo of Johnny Depp. No, that's a photo. Oh, yes, and that's Johnny Depp, right? We have to actually make that judgment even though we do it very quickly. Interesting, we're also criticised by these conflicting uh, intuitions. Uh, and it just happens, in fact, that the one person who criticised us in this regard was, was a sort of face person. And they were saying, well, it's obvious that persons are going to be recognised faster. If I'm walking down the street and I see my wife or child down the street, I recognise them very quickly. Right? And then the social psychologists are like, of course it's obvious that the group stuff will be categorised more quickly. Right? If we're walking down the street and we see a black person, we know immediately they're a black person. <laughs> Right? So the different researchers have very different fundamental intuitions about what would actually happen first. So we think that's a pretty good argument for our argument, which is that there is no a priori basis to assume that person information or group information will of necessity happen faster. Right? That'll depend upon a whole lot of other factors that are uh, in the perceptual situation. Um, <clears throat> so I want to move now to uh, impression formation. Uh, and so this is another area where we've sort of seen these sort of fundamental confounds in play. Um, and so we, we base these studies on really a very a typical 
um, exploration of impression formation uh, based around the idea of cognitive load. So the idea here is um, you present uh, someone about whom the participants need to make an impression. Um, they belong to a group uh, and they're also given information about the individual. The information they're given is generally half stereotypical, consistent with the group, and half that's not consistent with the group uh, that relates to the individual particularly. Um, and then they uh, make this interesting by giving a cognitive load task. So half the participants uh, do some sort of thing like a digit rehearsal task or circle the A's or some other kind of thing while they're doing this perception task. They also tend to sometimes manipulate outcome dependency, so motivation, so whether or not you'll get to talk to this person afterwards or so forth, so they're motivational factors. We're not so much interested in the motivation factors, but this more simple kind of um, processing factors. So consistently in this literature, you get this finding that under high load, you'll do categorization. So you're more likely under high load to, when you are asked later about Hilda, you're more likely to remember her gender stereotypical qualities than her non-stereotypical qualities. Okay, that's pretty consistent. But we think there's a problem here, right? So here's Hilda, some random person I picked out of my uh, iPhoto collection. Um, and uh, we want to know, we want to know whether people are going to think about this person as Hilda or as an elderly woman. Okay, and so part of the um, fundamental thing here is that Generally speaking, you can assume that all the participants have a broadly shared stereotype of elderly women. Okay, it might vary around the edges, but it's going to be broadly shared, certainly within a given culture. On the other hand, we have no idea who Hilda is, we've only just met her. Right? In fact, generally we've just got maybe not even photo a couple of words on a page, right? so we haven't really even met her yet. Um, and so we have to base our impressions on what we're being told right now. So our argument is that if we're trying to make a judgement about whether she's, an you know, whether she's consistent with the elderly woman stereotype, we're, we're basing that on our shared memory of that stereotype. On the other hand, if we want to know and remember something about Hilda specifically, we have to be able to rely upon the information we've just been given. Right? And so here's where the crucial thing comes in about load. Right? Because um, all the information then that's known about, is about the gender stereotypes and all the information that's unknown is about the individual. Right? So we argue right, that the key thing here is if you're under cognitive load, you're going to miss the new information. Right? If you're under cognitive load, you can't take in as easily the new information you're being presented with. What are you going to do? You're going to rely upon what you already know. Right? Now this is true for all studies in this domain. <laughs> We did a long list, there's about 40 or 50 studies, and they all have, they all basically work with this standard paradigm, right? So when they argue that categorization, oh sorry, so I'll get to that in a second. So we, we think there's other kinds of uh, uh, objects in the world that don't match this. So some people have actually argued that this is reality, right? So we know social categories, but we don't know individuals, therefore this is what we're interested in. But we argue that in fact there's lots of people who we do know, friends, celebrities, etc. We might also want to form further impressions of those or utilise that information in some way. And there's also other unknown social categories which we might want to learn something about. So our simple argument here is <coughs> what's really going on? When we do a cognitive load, right, is it really about uh, basically the determining whether we go between stereotype information or personal attributes? Right, or is it whether we go from what we're calling memory-based uh, to or data-driven um, processing? Right. So this, this gets us into a bit of trouble actually because it's, it's not easy to find a set of terminology that actually works for everybody. So we're not saying that this doesn't involve memory at all because clearly you read something and then you remember it a few minutes later. Right. So it does involve memory but our point is that you're given the information right then. Right. So it's driven by recently uh, given data whereas what we're calling memory based is you know, long-term stereotyped, kind of well-established memory kind of thing, right? So that's the, that's the way we're using the terminology. Um, so we did a couple of studies uh, where we, uh, we took the standard thing, which is basically this diagonal, uh, and then we added, we filled in the, the squares, do it the other way, right? And basically what we find um, is that there's no evidence that there's any um, benefit of group versus person that it's all about, whether it's known or unknown, right? It's all about data-driven versus memory-based. Uh, we had quite fun in the third study. We actually brought pairs of friends into the lab. 
So the friend then became the known category, right, from which they would rely under load, right, and the friends were told that their friend was going to join a, a university social club and were told something about that university social club. Interestingly, then when the pairs of friends rated each other at the end of the task, they actually incorporated the information from the club they were told their friend was interested in joining. They incorporated that into their, their perception of their friend. Right? So this is exactly what we would expect to happen. But it happens even in the context of someone you know as a friend, you've given some new information about them. If you're not under load, you incorporate that. If you are under load, you just go with what you know. All right, so, um, and what this led us to was really to revisit a classic model in social psychology, right? um, the um, continuum model of impression formation. The continuum model of impression formation has been cited about six gazillion times. It's one of the most well-known models in social psychology. Um, and it's very powerful for, de for dealing with exactly these kinds of situations. So you meet somebody new, you determine how much you rely upon their known social category memberships versus assembling the new information about them. Right? But we argue that since we're saying that's fundamentally confounded, if one unpacks the confound, the underlying concept of the continuum model is actually quite a useful one. You just have to change some terms. So it kind of makes sense that whenever we're forming an impression of any social object, right, if we have the res attentional resources, then we'll pay attention to whatever information we can gather about that social object, whatever we've known before plus whatever is new. Right? But if we don't have attentional resources, we'll rely upon what we knew before. Right? And what we knew before could be a whole lot of different kinds of things. So we actually, so these, oops, so this um, box in the middle here, this sort of double box here, is basically the range of application of the existing continuum model, right? These two cells, right? So classic impression of um, based upon known group attributes, or if we have the have resources, we basically create a new impression based upon the additional information that we've been given. So what we've done is to basically expand that fourfold, right? So we're basically saying, look, the target can be a person or a group. The source of categorical information can be a person or a group. We might just be using existing information or we might be adding to or forming new information. Right? And when you look at all those possible combinations, you get a whole bunch of, of different phenomena. Some of them already exist. So interpersonal transference is a whole field right, that exists on its own, but um, to my knowledge, they don't think of it in, the, you know, they don't kind of use anything like the continual model in order to understand what that is. But that's a whole literature right, that we think actually fits nicely in there. Um, several of these other things we think actually are also literatures which kind of exist but again haven't been really integrated. Uh, and actually this one, intergroup transference, to our knowledge, no one's thought of that. <laughs> so that's kind of one of those sort of new hypotheses that get generated by, by thinking of these things in this way. Uh, so uh, we think this is kind of interesting but um, we get some resistance to this. So uh, what's the heresy here? Well. Um, Fundamentally, we just get a lot of resistance from all of this work to the idea that categorization and individuation really are the same process. This is really made hard because of the terminology, right? So in the existing literature, they talk about categorization and individuation. What we're trying to say is it's categorization and categorization, right? And so what we find is when we're writing this stuff, when we're talking about this stuff, that we have to kind of often put categorization in, in uh, inverted commas or an individuation in inverted commas when we're talking about their way of saying it, right? And then uh, the other, we're, when we're doing it our way and so forth, it gets terribly confusing and sometimes they actually get offended that we've put their terminology in inverted commas, implying that it's somehow wrong. Well, it's not actually implying, we're saying it's wrong. Uh, but either way, they get very upset about it, right? Um, but we, we also think this nature of, particularly in social psychology, this is, the culture has, uh, in, uh, has um, 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 the, in which graduate students are immersed is so, and, and junior researchers are so strong that you know, we have a number of cases, and I'll just list one here. We, we shared one of our papers with a, with a colleague at University of Kansas, and she really liked it and actually used it as a discussion paper amongst the graduate students. And, and the feedback we got from her is they, they liked the concept and they liked the design. They thought it was very cool, but they just couldn't start talking about persons as categories. Right? Categories are collections of people, that's what categories are, <laughs> and they really just couldn't see themselves using that word right, in, that, in that broader way. Um, 
there's a real struggle for them. And so I think like some, some people kind of say, <clears throat> we've also had people sort of say, well, okay, now that you've made the argument, it's kind of really obvious uh, and therefore trivial, <laughs> right? Um, but if it was trivial, you wouldn't have graduate students saying, we can't comprehend this, right? So, so I think that's why uh, we think this is about heresy and orthodoxy, right? Because if it really, if it wasn't an orthodoxy strongly held, people would just say, oh, cool, okay. I'll start thinking of it that way now. But that's not what we find. Uh, yeah, and then the other, the other kind of criticism here is that um, uh, we're just not interested in those other things. So yes, we can see the point in the abstract, but we don't care about that stuff. So really there's no point in actually having a model that integrates all of that stuff. Um, and the, uh, the, the other kind of relevant thing here is that they, they really kind of argue that not only are they not interested in it, but they actually can't conceive of these other cases actually being real experiences that people have. And so this, is, this comes down to a fundamental thing here, that we argue that categorization of all of these kinds is ubiquitous. That's going on all the time. But what we do often get is this criticism that they can't imagine these things. And the reason for that, we think, is that you only notice these processes when they're problematic. So of course we go through the day doing all of these kinds of different forms of categorization. We don't notice them because they're not problematic. Um, a couple of other just quick things uh, to, uh, so those are the main ones where we have um, fundamentally challenged the orthodoxy. Right? So where we're taking classic literature in this particular domain and saying, oops, right, there's a fundamental confound here which is uh, fundamentally altering the way in which you see these things. Um, I'm, after doing this work for 10 years, I'm no longer surprised that they don't like that. But as a naive young person, I actually was surprised. I really did think they would just say, oh, cool. <laughs> we'll change what we do now. Good point. Didn't happen that way. So, uh, so those, those things kind of really capture those fundamental uh, conflicts between sort of uh, heresy and orthodoxy. Um, these next two examples, which I'm just going to talk about a bit more quickly, are examples where taking this idea of categorization allows us to take paradigms or ideas that are well developed in one domain and apply them in another. And so um, <clears throat> we took the who said what paradigm, which is an incredibly powerful paradigm based on work in, in cognition that's been used in social psychology to, to unpack when categorization will take place. Right, and the idea here is it's based on a source confusion idea, right? So what you do is basically take, um, take stimuli, present it on the basis of various category memberships, right? And then you give people a, a memory task and you look at the category memberships. So we've taken this basic paradigm and tried to explore it more broadly. So not only to sort of groups, but also to uh, persons and interpersonal and intrapersonal contexts. Um, and so um, how does this relate to categorization? Well, these source confusions, confusions tell us about the categorization process that's likely to have been in place while people were doing the perception. Right? So if you get more in-category errors on a particular dimension than out-category errors, then one can infer that that was the meaningful categorization in people's minds when they collected that information. Right? So in a similar way to the entitivity argument, if they're kind of seeing it's about gender, then they're more likely to remember the gender-based information, but they might forget other qualities of the information that don't seem to be so important and so forth. And so where that shows up as is this difference between in-category errors and out-category errors. So um, we took, so we've, we've done work with this on all levels, but I just want to give you one example. So we took an intrapersonal example. We took Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer's either a mother or a student. She's either at home or university, and she's either relaxed or focused. Right, we can, all, I think, all relate to these things. Um, and so we then, we had five different conditions manipulating the extent to which these different category memberships aligned with um, the, the kind of systematic quality of the, the behaviours, which were either nurturing or non-nurturing, or what we called analytical or non-analytical. Right. And so you can imagine here, it's actually kind of an interesting design because you can imagine that um, generally speaking, you would expect Jennifer to be nurturing as a mother and analytical as a student. But you can also imagine that she's likely to be nurturing, more nurturing at home than at university, right? and more analytical at university than at home, and maybe more nurturing when she's relaxed and more analytical when she's focused. Right? So you can imagine that there's association which could go 
around any of these categories. They're all plausible explanations for a distinction between nurturing and analytical behaviour. Right? And so we're able to manipulate those in a systematic kind of way. And so what you get is, um, so this is for the nurturing dimension. And the key thing we find here is that when role is, an ex is a good explanatory fit, right? So when she's always nurturing as a mother and non-nurturing as a student, uh, when they're presented the information, then that's basically what they remember. They remember her role, whether she was a mother or a student when they're presented the information. Um, if, on the other hand, the data was such that when she was at home she was nurturing and at university she was analytical, then that also uh, tends to be part of the memory process. But interestingly, when we had these other fit conditions, they tended to use the situation, interestingly, uh, as the basis of their judgement. So, if, for nurturing versus non-nurturing, basically if, they, if it didn't fit sort of role or situation, they just defaulted to the situation. They just expected it to be about the situation, and so that's what they remembered. On the other hand, for the analytical data, we get this nice pattern where uh, if, the, if the data fit with a role structure, then they remembered role information. If it fit with the home versus university, then that's what they remembered. And actually, if it fit with, fit with relaxed or focused, then that's what they remembered. Right. If they, we tried this role counter normative thing, so where basically mothers are, uh, mothers are analytical and um, students are nurturing. Right. Uh, and so what you, you still, they'll still pick up that pattern, but they're less confident in that pattern and they're exploring an alternative hypothesis, which is that it's situation based. Right. Now this is exactly how you would interpret this kind of data if these were group categories as well. Right? So, um, so we can take this kind of paradigm and explore these um, uh, parts of uh, a person's context uh, as if they were categories, essentially. We've done a series of seven studies which explores this across group interpersonal and intrapersonal, right, across a number of different kind of category things. Um, now, the interesting uh, heresy here, quickly, is that... Um, Again, like with the face stuff and the other stuff, the assumption is that there's only, how can you actually understand the categorization process here, because only one person, right? So if there's only one person, then how do we get in, cate in category or out category errors, right? So they, they can't quite get that, right? Uh, and so again, this is, we think, reflects this kind of orthodox assumption about the nature of persons and categories, which people can't overcome. Um, however, interestingly, looking at it this way is quite consistent with a number of models of self-complexity. So there, there's a huge literature on self-complexity and self-schemas in which people um, are assumed to have these different selves, aspects and so forth, um, that kind of come and go, right? So you're this self at this minute and you're that self at that minute, right? This is one aspect of yourself, this is another aspect of yourself. So there's a whole literature which in a sense assumes that this must be the case but they don't think of it in categorical terms. They don't, they don't use the concept of categorization, therefore they couldn't do this kind of experiment in order to actually explore the way that works. Uh, and the final thing uh, is just to follow up that idea of complexity. Um, so really, um, we, we were interested in this, I first got interested in this idea of outgroup covariation, which is essentially group level complexity. Um, <coughs> sorry, over here. Um, and I started to think, as I did all through this kind of thing, of if this is a group-based phenomenon, what would be the person-level equivalent? And so I started to do some work where, in fact, I took persons instead of groups and I got people to rate the subtypes of a person and then give those ratings and sort of generate some scores, etc. And only after doing that a couple of times did a, uh, a graduate student at ANU come to me who was interested in this other thing called self-complexity. And it turns out there was a whole whole literature that it did essentially what I was doing but used different measures uh, and sort of framed it differently. Um, but what's most intriguing about this right, is that the same person was doing both of these things. Right? So Patricia Linville was doing this work on group covariation and this work on self-complexity as two completely independent projects right? and has not said anywhere in writing at least that she sees these things as actually in any sense the same phenomenon. Right, so I've, one day I'm going to have a, have a conversation with her, but I haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, so, so this is just a, an, another example of how by sort of taking this broader view, we can actually uh, apply potential learning from one to the other. Um, and so really, what's the point? 
right? Um, where, what do we get from all of this? And really it's once, if we have something like categorization as a, as a sort of fundamental kind of thing that underpins all of this, I think categorization is actually uh, ideal uh, you know, to, be, to use as a kind of unifying theory of social perception. We know a lot about categorization now. Right. Um, we've been studying it in cognition for quite a long time. We've been studying it in various ways in social psychology for quite a long time. The two are not necessarily consistent and could, you know, so just one benefit is that we could actually in social bring new models of categorization to bear on, uh, on old problems, right? That we haven't really figured out, but the field of categorization has kind of progressed and we can learn something from that. Um, uh, it goes the other way actually though as well because Social psychologists are really, really fascinated by this idea of social categorization. They spend a lot of time worrying about black, white, men, women, old, young, right? All these kinds of things. It's, it's bread and butter to social psychologists. And so we know an awful lot about that kind of categorization, right? And I think actually some of the things that social psychologists have found out at least about that kind of categorization uh, could feed back nicely into more abstract notions of categorization in cognition. But in order to get there, we have much orthodoxy to overcome. Um, and I finish with uh, the final word from someone who the biologists in the room at least will recognise. Uh, and uh, this is what keeps me going uh, in the dark uh, tea time of the soul. Uh, four stages of acceptance. Uh, and we've had all of these. This is worthless nonsense. This is an interesting but perverse point of view. This is true but quite unimportant. And I always said so. <laughs> and with that, I'll finish. Thank you. <coughs> We have time for questions? <laughs>